So we're just giving a few more minutes for folks to continue to <clears throat> get on board. I was just mentioning to everybody that's on, it's going to be an open forum, so you'll be able to uh, unmute and ask your questions or utilize the chat. Hi, George. How you doing? Good. Welcome. We're just holding for a bit. Let some more folks come in. Howdy, Anthony. All right. Oh, gosh. Now we're getting some, a lot of folks. Awesome. Hi all, welcome. Um, we expect this to be a smaller session than our than our previous um, grant chats. So um, as we wait for a few more to come on, um, it we will introduce ourselves and then we'll look to just go around quick and and do some introductions of who's joining us, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> Hi, Kristen. Welcome. Hello, Phyllis. It's like we're in the room together. I love it. Hello, Katie. Welcome. Hi. So I didn't. I didn't hear that. Oh, I was just, uh, saying hello to Katie, who's uh, another person joining us. Hey. Oh. Hello. We're just giving a chance for other folks to join in, and then we'll we'll jump in with the Sweet. office hours. Yeah. Hello, Jennifer. Welcome. All right. Well, it's about four after. Um, so maybe um, just to get us started, Eddie, if you want to frame what we're going to do this afternoon and then maybe take down the slides so we can see everyone and we could go around and do some just quick introductions. Sure. Let me unshare. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Eddie Gonzalez. I'm the Director of Partnerships and Grants uh, with the NPS Chesapeake office. Uh, today's space, and I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves in a second, uh, but today was is meant to just offer an opportunity for uh, you to get in front of us with any questions you might be having as you're navigating the process. Um, you know, we, we can speak a little generally to project ideas, but uh, you know, we definitely want to be able to answer any questions you're having about the uh, anything you're seeing through the grants.gov part of the process or the sam.gov especially. Uh, we are recording the session so we can uh, keep track of these questions because if you're having that question, likely others are too. Um, it's going to be a bit of an open forum. So uh, when we get into the question uh, time, you'll be able to unmute and ask your question. Um, you know, we've got um, um, some folks monitoring the chat and the cameras. Uh, you can also use the chat function as well if you want to prep a question there, and then we'll get to them as we go. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to answering your questions, and I will turn it over to uh, my superintendent, Wendy. Hi, all. Uh, Wendy O'Sullivan. I am the National Park Service super superintendent for the MPS Chesapeake Gateways um, office, and i um, happy to be here. Uh, we have um, another colleague in our office. Um, Bob, if you want to say hello and then pass it to Rebecca. Hi, folks. Bob Campbell with the National Park Service Gateways Planning and Development uh, Manager. I'm happy to be on board with you. Rebecca? Hi, I'm Rebecca Stanfield McCown. I run the National Park Services Stewardship Institute and have been supporting the Chesapeake office in this work. Super. All right, so how about we go around um, and I'll just read off the names that I see in the participant list. Um, George Payne. Hi, uh, this is George. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm with the Harrisburg Redevelopment Authority and um, yeah, we're uh, interested in uh, some conservation issues and doing green space in, in Harrisburg and on Paxson Creek and things like that. Thank you. Randy? Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's good to meet you. Um, I am with the Reverend Samuel Green Senior Foundation. Um, 
and uh, we've been getting increasingly involved with um, environmental and his historical preservation, education, and workforce and economic development. So we look at how all these things come together. So I'm um, very, very interested in this particular um, proposal. Thanks, Randy. Um, Adam Lynch. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Adam Lynch. I work for Friends of the Rappahannock uh, Watershed uh, nonprofit based in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, we are excited to uh, revisit the, the Gateways program. In 2007, um, we got a Bay Gateways grant, which is way before I joined the organization, to support um, improved uh, signage and river safety information along the Rappahannock River in Fredericksburg. And uh, we are looking to refresh some of that original infrastructure with this grant application. So I'm really excited to be a part of this and look forward to learning more about the program. Thanks. Um, Amanda Cunningham. Hi, my name is Amanda and I'm from Baltimore City, Maryland. And I'm a volunteer board member with the Friends of Herring Run Parks. And we're uh, working with the NPS now, uh, have a technical assistance grant to develop an historic trail in our park. So we're looking for other opportunities to fund that um, exciting project. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Anita, I'm going to say Angeloni. Oh, you're on mute. I was trying, I was trying to hit the icon on my little screen instead of the real one. Anyway, and you said it right, Angeloni. And uh, I work for VOF. Virginia Outdoors Foundation, and we're applying actually because of a conversation that Wendy had with um, one of our um, senior management team and really excited about this opportunity. And we have can think of a lot of ways that we might be able to approach um, the strategic themes. So um, yeah, we're excited. Great, super. Um, Anthony Bates. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Anthony Bates, Partnerships Coordinator for CNO Canal National Historical Park. I'm glad to be here today. I'm excited to learn more about this grant and this opportunity to see how it can help with restoring three historic buildings that we have in Williamsport, Maryland, uh, through a partnership that we have through Medco and also Washington County, Maryland. So definitely glad to be here and looking forward to hear more. Super. Thanks, Anthony. Um, Jennifer Merritt. Hi, I am the brand new uh, grants writer and administrator at the city of Crisfield. Oh, and nice. yay. <laughs> um, so I am just here to learn today. Super. Glad to have you on board. Thank you. Um, Katie Louder. Hey, um, I'm the executive director of Baltimore Green Space, and we are interested in exploring this opportunity for uh, a couple of forests that we work with. We have uh, 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 Springfield Woods has a lot of uh, a lot of history around the space and in the space, and we'd like to develop some trail systems and um, and also develop some historical markers along the way to from one forest to another. So we have like all these thinking things we want to do with the park system. Super. Um, Kristen Goller. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for hosting us. My name is Kristen. I'm the tourism manager for Wicomico County, Maryland. We're located on the eastern shore of Maryland, and uh, my division falls under recreation parks and tourism, so um, working to improve our, our outdoor recreation offerings. So we have a, a few projects in mind that, that I think could be a good fit for this, so really appreciate the opportunity to learn more. Super. Um, Savine? Kalai, oh, I, you're, you just moved on my screen. Kalai no Q. No, how do you say it? It's Sevim Kalyonju, and no worries. I, I'm used to everything. Um, so I thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, guys, for reaching out to my organization. I'm the executive director of Green Muslims. And, um, uh, I'm, I'm here today. I, I made it to one of the first 
uh, meetings and then I missed another one. I'm here today to see if this grant really could work with the programs that we're aiming for over the coming year. We, um, we have a youth education program that we call our Dean is Green, Dean being the Arabic word for religion. And uh, every year we, we hold basically MIWIs through grants from Chesapeake Bay Trust. And we get um, you know local local American Muslim kids out into nature. For some of them, it's the first time, and they learn about the watershed and our impact on it. And and then we try to bring a little spiritual aspect into it as well about why it's important to care about nature when you're a Muslim. And so we try to make it very personal. But I um, I don't know. The COVID has had a silver lining for um, I think a lot of people know a lot. A lot of more people want to be outdoors now, and our community seems much more interested and ready to get involved with environmental activism. And so I would love it if you know we could, I still, I need to see how well this grant fits in with what we want to do, but I want to start doing something with adults and um, getting them a bit more involved and seeing if we can get them, get you know local American Muslim adults involved with other organizations that already exist that are doing things. So we're trying to serve as a, a platform to help people connect with other organizations, but first they have to learn about our watershed and what's happening to it and how wonderful it is, but how we have to protect it. So that's that's why I'm here today. Thank you so much. And thanks for the emails, because I wouldn't I mean, I'm too busy. I wouldn't have even known about this grant opportunity if you hadn't emailed me directly. So thank you. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thanks, thanks for being here. Um, Teresa. Donnelly. Yes, I'm going to my audio. I'm going to turn on my video. Um, so there I am. Sometimes the audio isn't very good when I have the video going. So I'm sorry about that. Me. Um, I am Teresa Donnelly. I'm the assistant director of the Catoctin Furnace Historical Society. We're uh, in Western Maryland. And um, I have been on some of the other um, Zooms, but I'm, we're really planning, what we're, we're hoping to do is to have an, in, we're applying on the inclusive interpretation part of this. And uh, we received uh, some NPS semi-quincentennial semi money to uh, stabilize our Iron Masters mansion. And what we'd like to do is possibly apply for funding to do an inclusive interpretation component to that project. And I'm one thing I'm unclear about is I, we're in the watershed, but how much of a, a conservation component, if any, do these projects have to have? Um, so, um, but... Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and Laura? Hi there. I, I just stepped in. Are we just kind of saying what we're doing? Just saying hello and introducing yourself, really. Yep. OK. <laughs> um, my name is Laura Charlie. I live down on the Eastern Shore down in Berlin outside of Ocean City. I started a small ecotourism marketing and consulting business last year. And um, I currently do marketing for virginiawatertrails.org. And my big dream is to create the Maryland version of it, but make it even better um, and expand into urban areas to hit more, uh, more diverse communities. And I've been talking to the city of Salisbury and we have some ideas on how to make paddling more accessible to the people who live downtown and people who visit downtown. So um, yeah, that's, that's my idea, <laughs> gist of it. Thanks. And I think um, our last in alphabetical order is um, Phyllis Terrell. Hi everyone, I'm Phyllis Terrell. I'm down here at the other end of the bay at Fort Monroe. <laughs> And i um, excited to, you know, learn more about the opportunities with this grant. We've got some ideas. I, I have to admit, I'm a traditional marketer, so I would love to be able to use some of these monies to market to some of the upper, uh, underrepresented communities to share the, the rich stories that we have here at Fort Monroe in this region. And so just want to make sure that that sort of project is... I think it's within the, the strategic themes and, and initiatives that you've outlined, but a lot of the projects I've heard about seem to be more, again, more traditional project based. And this one is obviously, again, the more marketing approach to what we want to do. But I'm open. And, and Lord knows we do have a lot of projects that we can put out there as well. But excited for this opportunity. So thank you all very much.
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did um, So we're going to capture those questions that came out during the, the introductions and get to those. But um, before we go on, did I miss anyone? Okay, super. It's great that you're all here. Um, and Eddie, I'm going to pass it back to you. Awesome. Yes, it's so great to see everyone here and th also the uh, to see the diversity of uh, audiences and programs that you all represent. Uh, to get us started, uh, since there are some folks here that um, are kind of backtracking a little, uh, I did have some opening slides uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, but I'll repeat, this is an open forum. Feel free to uh, you know start throwing in questions into the chat. Uh, we'll take them as they go uh, once I get through these first couple of slides. But um, And then there'll be an opportunity for, for folks to unmute and ask a, a verbal question as well. Uh, but just to, to remind everybody about what we're talking about, this is a, a series of network grants that we're providing out of the MPS Chesapeake office that will be part of an annual grant opportunity that we'll have. The, the scopes of each particular year may change uh, as we develop you know, our own office priorities, but at least this first round, we're looking at two themes within our strategic plan, and I'll mention those in a second. But I do want to start off by highlighting that because of some the ways our budget at work, budgeting process works and where we jumped in with this uh, grant opportunity, uh, we would normally have about a million dollars, but we are looking at over two million dollars this first round of grants. So that's part of why it's exciting to see such diversity of uh, organizations being represented and diversity of project ideas. Uh, we're really looking to invest. So if you've got any inkling of an idea, uh, you know, we'd love to have this uh, these grants help you start uh, putting some definition and scope to those ideas. Uh, and, you know, ideally getting some funding for them as well. Uh, we are still looking at the program at two different levels just to really gauge our uh, the types of capacity of, of programs that we're going to be supporting, one at the $25,000 to $50,000 level, and the other one really at the over fifty to, to one hundred and fifty. dollars uh, So our minimum grant was going to be $25,000, and our maximum with uh, this particular opportunity is $150,000. Uh, but within there, we think there's a lot of variability of uh, support that we could be providing, so we hope you're seeing that as well. Um, this is a summary, I'll go through the detail in a few more of these, but two grant categories, uh, inclusive interpretive initiatives, so anything that's expanding stories, expanding audiences, uh, expanding the people delivering uh, the stories or the places where the stories are happening, you know, really thinking about uh, all the different messages, not just the conservation message, but the heritage message, the cultural messages, the natural, the um, historical messages. All of those are within the scope of the park service, within the scope of what we look for in the watershed. Um, so don't see these as strictly conservation oriented or strictly uh, place based. Uh, a lot of it is can be weaving together stories that connect uh, different parts of the of the watershed. And then the second one is resilient communities and landscapes. Uh, so this is everything from um, how a community organizes to address local issues. Uh, what are the ways that uh, they have uh, resources at their disposal or training or uh, just a, a capacity to uh, convene? Uh, you know, whatever the local issues might be, we want communities to have uh, confidence and resources uh, to be able to organize uh, around those uh, issues themselves. So, you know, we think there's a lot of variability there, not just on um, uh, physical projects, uh, but also just uh, cultural barriers, things that um, really haven't had an, uh, a place to, to be addressed any other way. And throughout all this, we are wanting these grants to help uh, support efforts that expand or uh, evolve or encourage more diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and community engagement. Um, there's an aspect of us wanting to be able to provide resources that are hard to uh, get in other places for this type of uh, community activation. Uh, so be thinking about that as well. The other thing that we're really excited about is there's no match requirement. So, you know, of all of you that are listening uh, to this uh, um, presentation, whatever your needs are, you're going to be able to put that in the budget. And if you get awarded, you're going to get all the funds that you're you know, likely might be some negotiation on some of the different projects, but for the most part, 
uh, we're looking to invest in the, the entire project needs that you have. So again, this is a chance for you to come to the table with an idea that um, you know, it has been hard to find funding for elsewhere. Oh, sorry. Uh, and also we're looking at a broad, broad um, range of eligible entities that includes the private sector, which is a, a kind of a new area for Park Service to be moving into. But looking at the kind of work that we're looking to support, the private sector is a part of it, versus, you know, whether it's historical trades or the historical farmlands that exist or, you know, any of the private sector entities that are providing outreach and, and different programming. Uh, we want them all uh, at the table as well. We have mentioned it a few times, but all the projects do have to have a public purpose in order to be grant funded, which means there needs to be some sort of benefit to uh, some segment of the, pop the population uh, within the Chesapeake. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it can be as specific as you want to define it for the purposes of the impact, uh, but there does need to be a, a public purpose and the projects need to occur in the watershed. Um, finally, the just remember the deadline is January 30th. Uh, this is a hard deadline, so we're trying to be as uh, forward in providing as many resources as possible to get you to that deadline successfully, uh, but just make sure you've marked that on your calendar. Uh, and if you need a place to jump in, the um, I've listed our grant program, excuse me, the network grants landing page that has a lot of resources you can dive into. A reminder about eligible entities, almost everybody except the federal government and individuals are eligible to apply. So any sort of collaboration you can think of or individual organizations and institutions representing one of these categories uh, should feel very confident about applying. Um, we are looking to diversify the types of organizations we fund. So, uh, you know, especially if you are involved in uh, unique collaborations or, or have been thinking about some unique partnerships, this would be a great place to get some support for those partnerships. Uh, if you need some clarification, we do have a link on our webpage to the Chesapeake Bay uh, Programs County Map that'll help you, know, you define whether you're in the watershed or not. And then I mentioned the two grant categories, advancing uh, major inclusive interpretive initiatives with an equity lens and promoting resilient communities and landscapes through tourism, sustainability, conservation, and local economies. So it isn't just the um, you know, hard conservation projects, it's the uh, branding and promotion, it's uh, organizing communities to uh, take advantage of assets that are in their community as a way of bringing more people uh, to their locations. So a lot of different things you can look at there. Um, just to add a little more definition, within uh, major interpretive initiatives, we're going to be looking at projects that engage underrepresented places, help tell underrepresented and full stories, facilitate and galvanize conservation and quality of life messaging and strengthening a ladder of engagement uh, in various, whatever ways that you represent that engagement. Examples of projects are anything that is establishing and developing meaningful relationships where they can, uh, or projects where audiences are able to more fully understand uh, the messages that they're hearing uh, and that the messages are being heard by diverse communities. But also that linkage between culture and nature. We talk about the watershed as a physical place, but it contains people, places, and stories. All of those connections are worthy of investment. Uh, and then the ladders of youth engagement is, you know, a, a, a more specific example of the type of engagement opportunities that you might want to focus on. But it could be, you know, a, an audience that is significant to you uh, and your organization, building ladders of engagement for them as well. Under uh, promoting resilient communities and landscapes, you know, here's where it does get um, pretty varied in the types of projects that I think could could uh, fit within this category because we're looking to promote and market the watershed experience in all the different forms that it exists. You represent that diversity. What are your needs to do it better, to do it uh, more widely? Uh, and then to help promote a stewardship ethic, make these connections to the people, places, and the stories. Uh, with a, st a steward, uh, an understanding towards stewardship, and then facilitate collaboration for landscape and community conservation. Uh, this is where you know the ability for communities to come together, uh, to organize, to uh, be able to assess what are their local needs and how to how to address them, and then be able to find the resources to address them. 
advancing equitable access to the outdoors. This takes place in many different ways across the watershed, whether it's accessing, uh, putting kids on the water or putting kids on kayaks or getting adults into volunteer activities or just getting families outdoors and, and recreating. You know, there's a lot of different ways where providing equitable access uh, can be defined at the local level. And then finally, you know, growing the landscape and heritage-based sustainable economies. Uh, we want communities in the watershed thriving. What are the barriers right now that are keeping that from happening? Or where can you be investing? Where can we be investing uh, to really help you bring uh, more attention and uh, diversity of participants to the assets you represent? You know, again, here are examples could include uh, ways to make public lands and open spaces more welcoming and accessible. Uh, we're not working with a situation where if you build it, they will come. You know, it's really you build it and invite them and keep inviting them and show them how, why that, you know, this place is for them and, you know, cross your fingers that they can come. So, you know, where where do we need to be more purposeful in getting people to uh, these great uh, uh, cultural, natural and historical assets? Again, linking the ways that our watershed connects to each other within those three areas, nature, culture, and history, uh, would be uh, things that we would be looking at. And then also making the connections to underrepresented communities uh, in those kinds of programs, as well as what whatever is a new audience for you in your area. You're, you're going to be the best people to let us know uh, where your uh, community and audience engagement needs reside. Priorities, uh, I've mentioned it a couple of times in various different ways, but we are, these are investments. You know, we're looking to help you get to some next level uh, that you've been thinking about. So proposals that elevate the scope and audience of an existing program or proposals that expand uh, the, the programming to address any barriers for audiences that have been uh, limited. And then also proposals that kick off a new effort. Where have you been looking for some uh, startup funds uh, that uh, we can help uh, jumpstart something for you. One thing to note is that these grants, you know, we are going to be looking at proposals that are just looking to offset administrative or operational budgets. Uh, we know that that is a need out there, but, um, you know, it's, it's difficult for us to get into a position of providing annual support with these grants. So we are going to be looking for where we're making investments uh, in uh, along these priorities. Quickly on the review criteria, I'll, this is all spelled out in the uh, landing page th that you saw a link to. Uh, so there's a lot more definition of what goes in here, what the reviewers are going to be looking at. Uh, but essentially, you know, as you're contemplating your projects, your competitiveness is going to based on how you feel your project is going to be viewed within each of these areas. And we put the percentages there so you get a sense of what is going to be higher priority on the rankings. To start off, you know, all the projects need to connect to one of the two strategic themes. We think they're broad enough that it should encompass, you know, almost most projects that you, you can think of in those areas. Uh, but you want to make sure that you are making the connection to one or both if that's the way your project is designed. Uh, you can't have multiple components to your project that cross the different uh, themes. But in your narrative, you know, you should make it clear to us and to the reviewers how they connect back. Um, we also want you to be clear with us about how it is connecting to equity, inclusion, accessibility, and engagement. Um, you know, when the reviewers are reviewing these, they are making comparisons between like-minded projects. Uh, so those that are more clear in the expected outcomes and the expected impact are probably going to uh, rank better. Uh, and then the innovation of your project intent. What are you proposing? What are you looking to do? What are you, how will this change the landscape for you uh, within your um, sphere of influence? And then clarity of the project's operational plan. You know, the reviewers are only going to be able to gauge success by what's in the narrative, what you are providing. So you want to be able to convey that you're an organization that has done this kind of work, that knows how to do this work. If there's areas that you are looking for investment because it's new to you, just highlight that as well. Uh, but the reviewers are going to want to get a sense of your ability to do what you're saying you're going to do. Uh, and then who is going to be doing that? Uh, you know, you want to be clear on the team members you're bringing to the table. Uh, we do have a couple of um, optional components to add resumes for your key team members. 
and letters of support if you're representing a partnership or some collaborations. Again, really just meant to add additional uh, definition to what you're, you're asking us to invest in. And then finally, uh, a reminder of where we are. We're in the open process right now, soliciting applications. The application period will be open through January 20th, uh, 30th, excuse me. And then after that point, we go into the review process. Because this is our first year, things are a little bit uh, still to be determined as to the timeline in going into awards, but we're uh, hoping that the timeframe would be sometime in late summer. Uh, we would get through the, the full uh, review and, and awarding process. So that's kind of the basics. I do see the chat uh, lighting up. So I want to pause there and go ahead and uh, open us up to any questions. Let me see. I'm going to... Can grant funds be used for construction projects? Um, I believe we've determined yes, as long as it fits within the... Um, uh, funding level that, you know, with the $150,000 max award. And Eddie, for, for some of these um, questions that are in the chat, um, Bob and I have been answering them as, oh, as great. we go. Um, okay. Do you have one that you want to, uh, then I, I'm just scrolling through them. So if there's one that we can jump in with, let me know. There was a question about, um, you know, we were trying to also answer some questions that came out in the um, introduction section. So I, I did answer the question about whether the grants can be used for um, marketing and advertising. And, you know, how I answered that is that um, we are supporting tourism and um, um, promotional sorts of um projects and programs um, and so the funds can go to you know the development and design and uh, community engagement pieces uh, public education pieces but um, federal grants cannot be used to buy advertising so it's so it would be sort of just shy of um, of that those costs so funding so, the campaign but not the actual ads in the campaign like formulating the campaign. Right. Okay. Or other pieces of a campaign that aren't, you know, straight up traditional advertising. Yeah, I know we funded projects that are doing the um, focus groups or surveying uh, where you're doing, um, you know, uh, uh, customer surveying or potential, uh, you know, that leads into a, a branding strategy, those kinds of, of research oriented uh, projects around branding. Right. Eddie, let, let, me, uh, let me suggest maybe just one further clarification about your comment in response to the question about whether funds could be used for construction projects. And then you said, yes, as long as it fits within the $150,000 ceiling. So, so folks, bear in mind that, the, that the, uh, the grants do not require a match which is not the same thing as saying that the grants require that the total project cost be limited by our ceiling, right? So you may well have a project where, where you're, you're, uh, uh, you have additional money involved in order to, to complete the scope of the project the way you're seeing it, but, but the ceiling on, on the amount of federal funds that would be able to come in would be 150. It's a, it's a bit of a nuance, but if you're, if you're scoping high, then you may, you may need to cover some of your own costs. And if you're, uh, if you need not to have a match, then none is required. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we do have a couple of hands raised. Uh, so if we want to go to seven. Yeah. And do you want to just take the slides down? Oh, yeah. Thanks. I am playing around on my own screen so I can see my questions. And I keep, I also keep clicking on the wrong point and get very flustered. But anyway, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned already, I just want to be clear that. Um, our organization's goals do really fit with this program. I, when I started reading through all of the information and looking at the themes, I'm like, oh, does that is that really 
do we really do that? And then I hear, you know, there are other organizations that are trying to bring more diverse communities to the work that they're already doing. We don't have a location. We just take people around to different locations. So again, the programs involve partnering with other organizations that can host events. Is this in line with what you're looking for? The diversity part is, is actually no problem for us because we count as a, a minority community and we're diverse within ourselves. And um, I do see how it fits in with, um, again, trying to educate the community to become more involved with, with stewardship and other activities. I just wanna make sure it's in line. And if it is, do you have any suggestions to make it even more appealing? There was a reference to youth. We already have youth programs. Now I'm thinking of reaching out to, as I said, older, um, an older community as in not elementary age so that it could still be you know teenagers college students if that's more appealing but there's no yeah well to start there's no place based part to this so you know you don't have to be anchored in any location uh you're it, because it's people places and stories okay so if you're representing any of that you know you're and you've got an idea that would definitely count um the uh as far as uh, the competitiveness kind of question, you're really the one that's going to define it for us as far as a need. Uh, there isn't a, you know, it, uh, youth programs are going to outcompete adult based. It's going to be programs that are more well defined that have a sense of where they're trying to go, I think that are going to be. So, you know, I, I can't advise you directly on your particular project idea, but I can let you know that we're not looking for any one formula of project. We're not looking for, you know, a lot of this for us is what are the needs being represented by our community. This is the first year we've done these grants. We have nothing to compare it to. So you're also helping us define the diversity of needs that are out there. You know, we hope they all become successful, but we know we only have a certain amount of money. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that what you present to us isn't going to be valuable to us in some way, even for those projects that you know possibly don't get funded. Okay. Well, I also, I liked how you talked about you know, helping organizations get something started. It's not just this one-time project, but something long-term. And that's definitely what I see this as. Um, we've just haven't had the means before to, to do all of this. And this is an opportunity to give it a try. And if it's successful, yeah. then hopefully we'll have, we'll have, a, we'll have sources of funding in the future as well to keep it going. But thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. All um, right, Randy. Oh, yeah, sorry. Randy was next. And yeah. then... Uh, Teresa. Hello, this is Randy Council. I'm, I'm, I'm just retired from um, Morgan State the Department Chair, so I redirected my life in some kind of way. <laughs> it's steering towards this area. But the question I have is, um, uh, one, the first question is geographical area you serve. So folks who can apply are coming from all over the country, several certain states, or just Maryland? Just within the watershed for the Chesapeake. So, okay. so you know, the Chesapeake watershed includes seven jurisdictions, parts of New York, parts of Pennsylvania, parts of West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia, and all of DC. So as long as you're as long as the project or program is is occurring within the watershed for the Chesapeake, um, that's sort of the first threshold of eligibility. Okay. That's, that's helpful. The second question is, um, what about uh, capacity builders is an area that we've already have gotten funded for, we're very interested in, so training and those kind of things. But what about capacity building for um, um, environmental construction businesses? Is mm. that something that would, because um, we've been doing, working on that as well, is that there's a, there's not many minority business be truthful that are doing this work and yes the magnitude of the task for uh, to to achieve this program we require and so we've been thinking about that is that something well uh, you know one of the fundamental pieces here is is what Eddie talked about where there has to be a public purpose right so if there was a training program that you were looking to design that had a public purpose, that met, you know, uh, maybe the resilient communities piece, and there's a section in resilient communities about, um, you know, um, accessible outdoor recreation, 
you know, if, if there's a way to sort of line up the um, public purpose, the that it's in the watershed and and meeting one of the two themes, and it instead of it being a you know build something or or promote something, and it was a training, um, I, you know, I think I think that's a activity that still could compete well um, if it's framed and and meets the uh, criteria. Okay. And can uh, uh, the number of applications are, are we limited to one or application only? Um, you're not limited by how many applications you submit. Um, and um, there, you know, could be a way to, um, you know, certainly more than one of the two categories could be um, identified on how you're advancing it. So a single a project could be advancing both inclusive storytelling and the sort of vibrant, resilient communities uh, in your narrative. But in theory, you know, if you want to get into grants, up and submit more than one application um, and have the stomach for that, we would um, certainly welcome um, as many as you feel like you're interested in submitting for. Thank you. <laughs> Someone had a question before we go to the next hand raise. There was a question in the chat about getting the um, the uh, UEI number. Yeah, that was me, Amanda uh, from Baltimore City. I got caught in this loop where I was filling out our address and it wouldn't allow me to go forward only to cancel or go back. And then I went back and had to keep filling the same information out again in order to move forward to putting the address in. And I tried it several times and that occurred. Now, I guess I, I should just start all over again, um, but it was very frustrating that I couldn't go forward in my um, attempt to get that very first step. <laughs> Yeah, Amanda, uh, send me send me a note about uh, the issue you're having and uh, over email. I just put my email in the uh, um, chat because uh, okay. I, yeah, I know I heard from at least one other person that the turnaround times are taking upwards of two weeks now between uh, versus when I did it early on. It was three days, so I'm not sure what all might be going on. With that's why we wanted everybody to jump in soon. But just send me a note uh, about your. Um, uh, or I guess anybody, uh, I see Sevam also has been having issues. Uh, what, yeah, why don't you both send me a, a, a note with your specific issue and I'll see um, where there might be a hangout. Very good, thank you. Yeah, it's not our process, unfortunately, so I, I, it, it's hard to you know, understand without a little more detail, but uh, yeah, I can try to follow up with you. So it's Teresa up next. Yep, next. Okay. Um, I, one thing about what the problem with the computer, I don't know. I had, I, I'm not a computer expert at all, but I had trouble with my Maryland Historical Trust account recently, and I have a Mac. And what it turned out was I was using Safari and I switched to Google Chrome, and all of a sudden it was fine. It was doing a very strange thing. So that's my tip of the day. <laughs> but um, how but I actually just wanted to ask uh, I mean I don't know why or whatever but it did work um but I wanted to re-ask my question about the conservation component we're definitely planning something that will expand the audience and the voice and the inclusivity of the stories told um at our site within the Chesapeake watershed in a number of ways and also I think expand accessibility but I'm just I just want to make sure that I'm clear about that. It doesn't look like I need a conservation component, but I want to make sure of that. I guess I'm unclear what you mean by a conservation component. Do you, if I'm going to, um, does I'm, I'm telling inclusive stories about the enslaved iron workers at Catoctin Furnace, I'm interpreting the Iron so we're, Master's we're natural, Mansion. Yeah, and, natural, cultural, and historical. So any of those three. Okay. Types and, with, and recreation and recreation, yeah. But I don't. But those fit within the NOFO, right? That telling an inclusive story about people 
Okay. I just yes, don't want to spend. These, these are not conservation grants. They are grants meant to support the full breadth of what okay. the Chesapeake. I mean, that's what I thought from reading, but obviously I don't want to do the whole thing and then realize that I'm it was all for nothing. There's so, nothing more you. defined than what is in the, uh, so you know, a good check is yeah. go to the review criteria that's defined in, in the landing page. And that's the only definition that the reviewers are going to get beyond the okay. priorities I mentioned. So uh, okay. if you can check off and it, it hits those cri review criteria, you yeah. should be good. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. Okay. I lost track as to who was next. It's Katie. Hi, Katie. Hey. Um, so I love the idea of having the stomach to do two grants. Um, <laughs> but if <laughs> uh, we have actually, um, I guess I was surprised to learn that it doesn't have to be place based. And there, because um, historic Wilson Park has a lot of rich Black history that the neighbors have been wanting to lift up for a while. And so it's really important to us to figure out how to integrate that into the forest work we're doing. Um, but also, and also, we protect 16 spaces that we're really interested in getting more people engaged in and with and doing kind of community based like I'm, you know, in the midst of doing a few proposals around like a, creating a community based needs assessment to understand how people are interacting with the green spaces want to interact with them would be more would get more involved with them. And it never occurred to me that this would be a, a source that could be applied to something like that. Um, but it sounds like it is. Is that correct? You know, without knowing more about what you're trying to do, I, you know, I'd still think if your project is anything on the spectrum of community engagement or mm -hmm. uh, you know, assessing community needs mm -hmm. with respect to local assets or local opportunities, I could yeah. see it being uh, an eligible project, you know, okay. and, and unfortunately, we're not talking competitiveness here. We're really just talking eligibility. Sure. Yeah. Um, but again, the, the 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 double check for you is mapping it to the review criteria, and and you know as long as you're feeling confident that your narrative is going to describe how the reviewer is going to be looking at it with respect to the review criteria, it you know everything else is just an eligibility question. Yeah, and then I guess like similarly, like I'm wondering if we could do a com would it make it? I mean. Could we do a combined proposal like we want to do this one thing over in this one place that is very specific but we also want you to help us with the with kind of working on this engagement strategy for the larger scope of our sites mm -hmm. with that okay sounds good thank you yeah it's it's a, there's no additional uh, benefit but we we you know we want to see collaborations because that means there's more people involved in this work and that you're using the grant to bring more people into the work Okay, so perfect. That's certainly uh, something that would be great to consider for this grant. All right, next is Anita. Hi, um, I'm just asking about some of the conversations we were having in my organization. What with this, uh, since everybody's asking about uh, the eligibility questions, we'd like to use, we'd like to apply for funding that would fund a program that funds equity and access and environmental justice and all those smaller projects that we've been funding for a few years, but we need we need to sustain that funding now from outside in order to keep this program going. I just wanted to make sure that was, it seemed like the word program is clear enough, but I just wanna make sure that if, you're, if we're talking about funding a program, this is the kind of program we're interested in applying for. Yeah, I mean, I think the the what Eddie talked about earlier was there. Of course, we are funding projects and programs, but the concept of sort of funding a uh, operational cost that's an ongoing operational cost is not the intent of um, of these funds. So I guess that's the distinction. So if there's something that is sort of packageable for um, that that is related to the program that's ongoing, but then you're looking to, you know, do the next step of it or, um, you know, try something new versus sort of underwriting an ongoing program. 
No, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be for operational costs. It would be actually for money we could give out. So so um, we would consider that sub recipients. So you would be looking to, and this is a really good question for everyone to hear and, and think through. So you would be looking to receive funds to then further disperse as support. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. To people who are applying to us for, for grants. Interesting. But you don't have them identified yet. They'd be applying as part of the program that we'd be funding. We we have a new grant grant round coming up. We have grant rounds. We have two grant rounds a year. So the new one will be coming up in the spring. So that would be. Okay. But there's a certain type of project that we fund and it checks all, all of the boxes as far as equity and inclusion and accessibility and community-based community. I mean, communities come to us with these ideas and we try and fund them. And so we're just, we're run out of that first tranche, I think the word is, of funding. And so we're looking to continue the program basically. Right. Through right, other right. through through other sources. Mm -hmm. The the way the grants are set up, it would allow for subrecipients. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know, Bob, whether would would they would it need to just be defined that the process is happening and then and then later, if if this was a project that was selected, the the individual recipients are are then identified. I, I want to make sure that we have the right information here. I can bravely say that I don't know. I think we better try not to answer this now and see if we can answer it later. Somebody's asking us a question that's never come up before. So we got nothing. Yeah, yeah. So um, what we'll do is we'll look into this and we have a, um, a, a living document that's on our landing page, that's the FAQs. Um, and so every time we get questions that are, um, that would benefit the whole to, to have the answers for, we add a section to the FAQ. So um, you have just brought forward a very helpful, good question. Um, mm -hmm. And one that's um, pretty exciting in, in, in concept. Um, so uh, we'll follow that up and add it to the answer to the FAQs. Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah, the sticking point really is just the vetting of the subrecipients and what the if there's something that would need to be defined ahead of time in order oh. for us to consider it as a grant. But you know, I definitely like the idea that you're presenting as a something that we'd want to explore as an office, even if for some reason it got it would get sticky with the grant. Um, but I do have that note to follow up with. The, the role of a subrecipient would typically be uh, appropriately f defined for a, a, a partner, an implementation partner that has a specific role and function to implement a part of uh, a part of a project that's that's described. Where, where it gets problematic for us, Anita, is whether or not that definition is going to be appropriate for you to then you know run a separate solicitation. And, and make grant awards or not. I, I, I don't think that that's what's gonna be considered a sub-recipient. Uh, but, but again, you know, we, the hazard of, of opening up for questions is, is that we don't necessarily always have immediate answers for you. Sure, thank you. All right, next up is Laura. Hi, I do have a question about sub-recipients. Um, I, I'm working with a, a potential partner and I'm going to have them write a letter of support. Um, I did read in the, the, the fine print that they need to be registered in SAM.gov. Uh, do they need to be registered by the end of January or do they just need to be registered before they get the funds? I believe they just need to be registered if you were selected and before they get the funds. Okay. Um, and then also for letters of support, do you have any, any key information, recommendations on key information that they should be including? Because I'll be getting letters of support from partners that will receive dispersed funds as well as just cheerleaders that have a stake in my project. Right. Um, 
I mean, Eddie, Eddie, you know, chime in, but, you know, using the exact same title that you're using in the application um, is, is really important for any support letter. Um, and, you know, I mean, hitting on how, what role they're playing, if any, um, and um, trying to also, all support letters would be helpful to understand um, their perspective of why you're, you know, uh, ready or, or a strong applicant. Um, anything else, Eddie or Bob, that come to mind for support letters? No, I will say we're capping it at two pages because we aren't looking for a CV of these organizations. We're not, you know, it's really meant to be as specific as Wendy is saying. What is the relevance? Why is that an asset to you? Uh, and just that it conveys their support and enthusiasm for being a partner. You know, that's, they're, we're not going to dissect it any more beyond that because it is an optional uh, component. So, right. yeah. And, and, uh, and we would, I, in general, we would, uh, we would ask you to put a premium on, on the letters of support from the implementation partners, right, that, that are really speaking to their uh, their role in relationship to the execution of the project, those those are ult ultimately uh, more essential to your application package than than uh, uh, than cheerleader letters, just because right. you know categorically everybody has cheerleaders, but <laughs> but you may have specific partners that have to say, we got it, you know, we're we have this particular expertise for this assigned task within the scope of this project that's that's why we're we're committed to doing it okay um and as far as the finances go if you're awarded the grant is are any any finance any funds given up front is it all at the completion can there be benchmarks that you meet along the way does it vary for each award Not having done these yet, I will. It it varies yeah. for each award. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Uh, you know, categorically, the money is is reimbursable money. Uh, what what you the main thing that your your organization will have to to be mindful of is is you know just not to draw funds in it in advance uh, too far in advance of your of your uh, control of the deliverables of the project, right? You would never want to get into a situation where you 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 uh, have drawn more funds than um, than is a, is appropriate for the degree of execution that you have. Okay. Um, and then my last question um, from the so when it was the grant was first announced at a million dollars, I know you guys had a breakdown. It was like seven to eight projects in the 25 to 50,000 range and then one to two over 50,000. Does that ratio still stand with the 2 million or is it anybody's guess? I would say you could, you know, realistically say we're doubling each of the two categories, but honestly, uh, not having a sense of what's kind of come in the door, I would be more comfortable saying anybody's guess now. Okay. Uh, that's really the, how we would envision a target but I can't commit us to that without seeing the levels that are going to come in. Okay, thanks. It's all one review process. You, you know, we're, we're looking at the two categories just in terms of scale, but it's the one review committee is going to review all of them to be able to gauge you know, fluctuations between the two categories. And who is the review committee? <laughs> mm, wow, uh, okay. Am I allowed uh, the, to ask that? <laughs> We're they still be... working on, there'll be a panel that's identified that are, that are not, you know, the people you see here on the screen um, okay. that are, yeah. that are um, outside of our direct office. Yeah, it won't be a secret, but we don't have them confirmed yet. It is ne next on the list of, you know, just all the things that need to get done. but it'll be a, a mix of external and internal um, reviewers that are all, you know, subject matter expert in some form. All right, Kristen is next. We're one minute over. So let's get this right. one last question. Thanks, in. Thanks again. This is a, a follow-up, I think, to, to Laura's questions. As far as the maximums, um, knowing that the larger projects you're assuming would only a few would be awarded versus the smaller, 
if you put in an application for one of the larger projects and maybe funding, or it's not quite as competitive as some of the other larger, but it would be competitive in the smaller, would it automatically be sort of put down to that smaller category by the panelist or um, potentially is that a decision we should make in advance? No, I think, uh, you know, they're going to be looking at the projects as a whole and funding projects as a whole. And if your project is competitive at the higher level, you know, we definitely want it to be coming in at the higher level if that's what it's going to take to get to what you're looking at. Uh, you know, I do at 2.2 million. I, I feel like we're going to have an ability to do a lot more of the larger projects than we were initially anticipating because we still want this investment to be fairly well distributed amongst the seven jurisdictions amongst different kinds of projects. And that was gonna be a little harder to think about with only a million and say three came in at a hundred thousand that, you know, that's a third of the budget. We, I'm not going into this process now feeling that constrained, um, but I know reviewers are gonna have the ability to say this project is great, but of the four things they're proposing, really three seem the more realistic. Let's go, you know, and they could potentially say this should be awarded, but at three quarters uh, and, you know, negotiating some change in scope. Uh, but otherwise, they're really just going to be looking at the projects as they come in and and reviewing it on on its individual merit. OK, thank you. And if I could ask one quick follow up, as far as the max at 150, um, we're considering an application from like Comico County, but I'm a part of a informal alliance with all the eastern shore counties on the shore of Maryland, and that that might put forth an application as well. So is the total limit 150,000 or is it per application? Per application. Per application. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A uh, question came in from Randy about uh, uh, talking to someone about construction opportunities in the watershed. We'll have to get back to you. I don't know that I know of a specific person to point okay. to, Randy, uh, or if there is one on the Park Service side, but we'll see how we can right. get some feedback to you. Yes, sir. All right. Well, I see still one more hand up. I know we're over time. Um, it's Teresa's hand, so I think oh, okay. unless she has a new question, I think we're good on hand. I did put the website uh, on the um, the FAQ website. I put my email address as well uh, at Chesapeake underscore grants at Chesapeake at uh, MPS.gov. If anything else comes up, uh, that's the email we're monitoring for questions. Uh, and then otherwise, uh, I'm going to put the landing page real quick. Where are you physically located? Are you in Annapolis. Place? Annapolis. So am I. So I could have walked yeah. over there. <laughs> Thanks. Well, yeah. Um, We're in the, um, we, we recently moved into the old, um, it was like an old uh, auto insurance building across from Safeway on Forest Drive. Oh, yeah, exactly. Where it is. That's where you are. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone. We have another session tomorrow morning. You're all welcome to come back and do that one from nine to 10. Uh, it's a different link. It should have been on the same email. Uh, so yeah, um, definitely come back if uh, you have any more questions and we thank you for participating. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Y'all have a good evening. Good night.